There are a lot of examples in the University of Scotland report about the universities working with schools. Um, it appears to be something that the government is encouraging. Is there going to be some resource moving to universities to, to allow that to happen? Because at the moment, it's mostly on goodwill. Um, and I don't think the universities can carry on just using goodwill. Uh, we, we will want to look at I mean, the overall resource methodology. But this is quite, I mean, from, from my perspective, this is really quite fundamental change. Uh, and, and to me, I see education from not just from 3 to 18, but well beyond that. And how do we make that, how do we make that work properly? And how do we then get the resource allocation methodology right? So I, I, I think there should be more, I mean, my personal view is there should be more kids, young people, moving from, from <coughs> fifth year directly into first year. Uh, and, and we can do that really efficiently, but that's part of the mechanism which we need to look at how does funding allocation work. But it may well end up with what we have, if, if we do have schools co-located with our campuses, we might do half the teaching, schools might do half the teaching, and we'll need to get funding methodology that properly reflects that. But just now, we are working with the school sector and a lot of it is in a good, good world basis. But it's fundamental to try to move, move these agendas forward. They're quite challenging, but we will work. We, we do push government quite hard on funding. Uh, and, and, and we did go into a spending review exercise uh, where we proceeded with this having been quite successful. We say, I, I think we say tough but fair. But uh, we would want to look very carefully at how how funding is used most effectively and efficiently for, the, for, for our learners. And it's not about universities, it's not about schools, it's not, it's about how do, we, how do we get the right package for our learners. <coughs> Inevitably, there need to be some kind of shifts of resources, either into yeah. or out of universities. Because as a business model, if, if we're going out delivering our first year to schools so that the children can then come straight into our second year, it <coughs> doesn't add up. But we're not business. No, no, but we still have to balance the books. Yes, we do have to balance the Oh, <laughs> <laughs> tell me, yes. yes. But, but we would have to look at all of that. I, I would just endorse that. I mean, I do think that the <coughs> slides that, that uh, I was going to show you is one that I use from time to time. It talks about picking for excellence being a transformational change. It's not a term I particularly like because it tends to be a bit scary and frightening for lots of people. They think, well, we're <coughs> doing lots of things significantly different to what I'm already doing just now, and we may already be doing very well. But I think it is transformational change for the system as a whole, the learning system in Scotland as a whole. Although it is about 3 to 18, I think the more common effect, and Seamus has picked up well on these slides, is such that it's inevitable that uh, there will need to be a look at the, the resourcing of that transformational change in order that it can continue down the road. And I do think that the kind of exercise, I just said to Shea, Mr. Speaker, Colin Grant, the Director of Education, in the Jason Galloway just yesterday morning, about the Crankton campus. And you know, I think that showing those kind of models working well for learners, because that's the critical bit, that's where the focus is. We need to look at it from through that side, that lens of the telescope. It's how will all of this benefit the learners that are going through the system and going through our hands. I think if, if more and more of these things are seen to be working, just as we've seen in the college sector with school college uh, uh, work and some of the schools for work initiatives, then I think the, the resourcing will, will need to be redistributed in order to try and accommodate that. And it's a bit of what we said to Terry in the early years. You know, I do think part of that transformation change is about the resources that then make that transformation change in reality. Could you just tell us who you are before? Uh, yes, my name is Amelia and I'm from Glasgow Learning University. And my question adds up a little bit to the previous question, and it's mainly to the question of the date, but it's my big for that as well. Um, as you well know, there's a huge gap between sixth year and first year of university, and there's also a big gap between first year of university and second year of university. And I, I, I believe that there will be more of a negative effect for six-year pupils from schools to go directly into second year to second year of university. 
If you accept that the SEQF is a model, is a model that works, there is a there is a rational flow <coughs> through the SEQF. Uh, that rational flow is disrupted at the six year old school. Because fundamentally you know, the hires will, will take us to level six. Advanced hires should rationally take us to level seven. If you had a coherent grouping of advanced hires, uh, then you could move into first year of university. That's very difficult to get, but that may be something that we can make work. But, but if, if you accept SEQF uh, as, as, as a rational model, as an acceptable model, I'm afraid you know, then the logic is students should move from fifth year into first year of university or sixth year into second year of university if we get the learning models right. Currently they're not right, that's what I would say, but, but that, that's the rational model. Just comment on that as well. I think it's interesting. I, I do know of some university programs that have explicitly designed their first year around the advanced hire service, such that students, if they haven't got the relevant advanced hires, can take first year. But if not, they can go directly into second year. But it induces that level of seamlessness yeah. into it that I, one is really looking but, for. But, but I, I mean, I don't know if you to tell if you've had the same experience as many of my colleagues have told me about. And, and that, that there is a reluctance to, to do that, even though they may have that access into second yeah. year. Uh, that there is a fear factor and reluctance to do it. Indeed. And, and so that's a cultural issue. I think there is, there is something in your question, Amelia, which is worth commenting on. The school side, and that is, I think, part of the direction of travel that we are seeing emerging is the introduction of additional Scottish baccalaureates. I mean, we have two at the moment, and we are like, and we will have another two further down the road. Now, I think uh, it was a very bold step to introduce them. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that we got uh, we got them right in uh, uh, science and uh, maths, but I think social subjects and uh, that's coming around the corner, uh, modern languages. I think we've got. I think we can learn from the introduction of those and the extent to which they, they do better prepare as part of a clutch of uh, awards uh, learners who, who may choose to go from uh, school <coughs> straight into S2 modern university course. There's a sort of microphone disappearing. Yeah. Hi, Wendy May from GCU. Um, the response to um, by the University of Scotland is very much school focused in beyond the senior phase, but the colleges are also delivering curriculum for excellence. And I'm wondering, as a response to put learners at the centre, if there's a similar push to work with colleges um, to, be, to close the gap. Uh, well, I think yes, and your university works because my university works is very closely with colleges, and certainly that transition. Now, there is a challenge. You know, there is a tra challenge in the transition from the college sector into the university sector uh, in terms of them um, teaching methodology uh, and assessments. But but you know, th there there is a lot more movement between college and uh, university than perhaps we give credit for. I do think as well, uh, Wendy, that part of the regionalisation agenda that the colleges are going through just now. Uh, is again the kind of direction of travel that perhaps makes the, the, the articulation with higher education institutions that much easier than maybe was the case when we were sat at our 41 uh, discrete colleges. And I know that I have the remit for the colleges and the inspection of colleges currently. And, uh, and the college sector, as you know, is going through real traumas just now in, uh, in applying the regionalisation agenda, but I think one of the one of the positives potentially to come out to, from it would be that closer articulation with higher ed. Still hear you. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so it must be working slightly. Yeah. Okay, is that better? No? Does but it sound different? It's slightly different, yeah. Anyway. Different here. Uh, so pick up on the, the question that I asked earlier, which was about um, how to, to measure the, the success and achievement from curriculum for excellence, and particular, in particular the broader capabilities and competences that go beyond the academic uh, achievement. And the slide that Professor McDade showed that talked about looking for some way of actually capturing that, perhaps through a, a school's equivalent of HEAR, um, I think it's still too early to tell whether that goes beyond just measuring activity to achievement. But uh, I was very interested to, to hear the, the mention of the senior phase benchmarking uh, activity, which I've, I've not heard about before. I'd be just interested to know if there is activity going on within the school sector to take that whole area further, so that when the first cohort of uh, school pupils reaches university in 2015, and is applying in 2014, we're going to be in a position to actually understand the and differentiate between levels of achievement between the between different pupils. Yeah. I mean, there, there is a major exercise on the go just now, which I should have mentioned in my presentation, which is to encourage uh, learners to to develop uh, profiles at the end of P7 and at the end of S3. Now these profiles are designed to do the very thing that we're talking about, and that is they are the responsibility of the learner in the first instance to pull together their most significant achievements in the course of their year. And the idea is that they will build up into a personal achievement folder or folio or whatever. Quite a number of schools and authorities are using e-portfolios as a means of introducing this. And they're, they're a significant step away from what was the old 16 plus wine list where you know, folk got a nice folder like this with plastic wallets and they stuck some of their work in. It's a genuine attempt to try and both encourage learners to take some responsibility for recognising the achievements that, 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 that they are most proud of and having that referenced in some way. But at the same time, at these key points where learners are departing the primary school sector, and then departing the end of a, the broad general education sector, usually at the end of S3, uh, to recognise the achievements, the wider achievements beyond what they've achieved in, in, uh, or attained in terms of uh, uh, curriculum levels, try and encourage that. And at the same time, a strong push, well, it's not mandatory, but a very strong push to try and get learners going into the senior phase to maintain that, both to present an interview or uh, to, to a potential employer, but also perhaps to help them with their, uh, with their uh, statement, their application statement for whatever uh, course, whatever sector they might try and uh, follow. So there is work going on just now. I have to say that there is also at the same time, as you'll appreciate, it's the same in HE as I'm sure it is in the school sector, uh, workload issues that, uh, are being, uh, that uh, are being cited. And uh, the actual the actual creation of these profiles uh, has been seen to be a workload issue uh, by some of the professional associations. But our expectation from an inspection point of view is that as of this time next year, all P7 youngsters will have a profile of whatever sort and all S3 uh, youngsters will have a similar profile. And the encouragement is to try and get learners to build that up through the course of their, of, of their kind of school career <coughs> and for it to have some meaning beyond you know, an, an end of school graduation ceremony or whatever. And again, that's the kind of thing that the college sector and the higher education sector need to be engaged in discussion with school about in terms of recognising these sorts of programmes. I think that's fantastic developmental activity, which of course continued in universities as well. And it's it's great for the students that they, they have that portfolio. And it would be great if the uh, university uh, admissions officers, which I'm not, <laughs> we could actually interview all the, the students to come and validate whether or not the achievements are in the portfolio are actually sort of truly reflecting their, what, what they, they have learned. And I suppose what I'm trying to to look for a bit beyond that, to have some sort of validation of that achievement yeah. that will facilitate admissions, uh, the admissions process taking account of that extra information. And 
really important, fantastic that the students actually have it, but we don't have the resources at the university level to, to make the sort of use of it that um, happens in job interviews close to university, at least not on a large scale. <laughs> If I could maybe just pick up on that as well, I, I think this is a really interesting <coughs> discussion on the notion of portfolio um, and the creation of portfolio as a record of achievement does have some echoes of, of Bob Burgess's uh, here record. And I'm also conscious, I'm, I'm looking to my colleagues from Glasgow School of Art, uh, it's my belief that admissions into the art schools actually does rely already a great deal more on portfolio and what, what, what an admissions tutor would expect to see is not simply some works of art, but a, a developmental process that allows them to understand how that individual um, is, is developing their creativity. But it seems, but there's, there's I'm, the, I'm, I'm, the, the, the proposals for the, 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 the year report that would be validated by the institution. It's not yes, just absolutely. It, it, <laughs> would, be, so it, it would be marked in, in that way. But the, 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 the things that worry me around this are, are, are the same as Val about validation of that about the workload, because the, the art schools um, are faced with a lot of applicants, I'm well aware of that, but if you then multiply that between, across all of the disciplines in universities, <coughs> also the fact that, that, that the HEAR, <coughs> which we're confidently talking about, was, <laughs> not that to, was, was not a particularly well-received idea. Um, um, I suppose what I worry about with this is that, it, is there any danger of a university or several universities almost opting out and setting their own examinations and just going, okay, if you want to come to this university, you have to pass our entrance exam. Well, there's always that possibility, I suppose. I mean, that's a possibility at this stage without curriculum for excellence. Uh, in terms of the validation, the, expect the expectation is that any young person would, uh, would create that portfolio, have the responsibility for creating that profile or portfolio, there, there would still be a, a professional teacher input to it. Now, the, the extent to which that becomes a validation exercise as opposed to simply uh, helping them select the most appropriate stuff to put in it, uh, and that is still part of the ongoing learning experience. This is our first year in that kind of thing. And obviously, as I said earlier, there are a lot of issues in the school sector as well that impinge on <coughs> <that. Yeah. laughs> Alan Kingdom from Celix Galileo. Uh, we've heard a lot about the quality of the process and trying to achieve all the, the, the great things about successful learners, etc. But I'd like to the panel to address the question of quantity. We've heard about the rapid drop in the number of uh, young people coming into the system over the next five to ten years. We also have the huge problem that the major output of this system is going into industry, which is going to be denuded by the, the older grey population over the next 10 to 15 years. And we have a huge demand for replacing infrastructure, building new manufacturing industries. And I think an unintended consequence of curriculum for excellence will be a huge reduction in the number of people taking STEM subjects and being restricted in their choices of courses at university. And there is evidence of that as, as of today with as part of the broad general education pupils starting the new S3 uh, sort of this week are in much smaller classes than the equivalents were last year. And I think this is a huge problem for Scotland and the interest in the response to that. Can I pick up in the dock? Uh, I, I mean, I think if you pick up, I mean, yeah, good man, Jason, I've got the issue that I understand. Yeah, okay, I mean, I think from the drop in numbers, Alex, I think one of the things that uh, critical excellence senior phase is trying to do is to recognise that we all know learners learn at different rates and so on, and there, are, there is a strong argument for having maximum flexibility to allow them to achieve their maximum potential. At, 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 uh, within the school sector and for some youngsters that may mean taking a higher level two years for example uh, or it may mean them doing higher in a year and then doing advanced higher perhaps over two years in order that they can leave the, the, the school uh, with 
the highest achievements possible that will you know, gain them entry into whatever, including uh, universities. So I think one of the ways in which the system may be able to deal with that potential drop in, in numbers is by embracing that flexibility and allowing uh, and recognising the fact that as learners, even at a senior stage in, in uh, school education, continue to learn at very different rates and mature at different rates and so on. One of the one of the ways of uh, trying to ensure that the numbers do not drop as much as they might is for universities to to, to be flexible in, in their admissions so that there are youngsters who perhaps will have come through having done a two year higher. Uh, at the end of the day they are still showing a, a, a level of competence uh, going into higher education that someone undertaking it on a one year basis. I know that you can read in between that uh, question, questions about their application and all the rest of it, but I do think that one of the ways of addressing that numbers, as I say, is to embrace that flexibility at the senior phase of I, 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 I would echo your concerns that there is a major shift away from school study, uh, which would underpin STEM subjects, because I know talking to employers, uh, I get to beat them about the head that we don't produce enough engineers, for example. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm part of that as it's called intakes, uh, which are improving due to big increases in demand for engineering, which is, and perhaps that's because it's seen as a more attractive career option going forward. Uh, I, I've spoken with some chief executives of, of companies with fairly large workforces to ask them to do a 10 year projection of what the workforce is going to look like. Uh, sort of the HR directors and start pulling their hair out in panic and either looking to recruit more and get a more phased increase in the workforce moving forward. But there are, you know, we, we need to produce people from the STEM areas and, and, and I think that there is a moment in curriculum for excellence of the school sector to make sure that we don't see a drift away. Uh, and universities you know, <coughs> have to react to the requirements of employment organisations as well. And that may be around flexibility or support structures when they come in, maybe not with the right skills levels, because there is a potential big gap in that. Yeah, the, 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 the real problem, um, well, the first real data point I've got, and I've been concerned about this for a number of years, now we have SD started, and um, at a recent meeting in the Scottish Parliament, a physics teacher from Grace Mount in Edinburgh said that the current SD has started uh, of course, part of broad general education, they're going to cover all the E's and O's, but they have got a physics class, uh, and that physics class has eight pupils in it. Last year, they put them to 40. So don't talk to me about two years, two king da 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 We're talking about a factor of five reduction in one of the key subjects for producing science and engineering literate people to meet a sustainable economic stock. But it, it, it is a huge problem it is with us now. The companies cannot recruit enough graduates today for an output of the 5 to 14 system. What chances there are even the levels of changes that happen just now will have in 5 to 10 years' time when this cohort will do the system and start coming out of the graduate Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that the direct causal link between a move from 40 to 8 is as a result of different directions. Uh, and you know, I was going to cause well, a step change at the same time. So, yeah, well, I mean, there are, there are a whole host of reasons as to why numbers can drop, uh, not necessarily by that scale, but certainly the numbers can drop one year to another in any secondary department in any school. So, I, I think I think you've been slightly mischievous suggesting that it's not just, just entirely, entirely as a result of curriculum yeah. excellence. That's what I'm you're just suggesting. Saying, a data point. Yeah, well, it's a single data point. There will be 367 <coughs> secondary schools in Scotland, but you can see. And you know, I think the generalised from that particular one is, is not particularly helpful. But I take your point. This is a school that, if you're correct in what you're saying, has made a decision to offer youngsters a choice at the end of S2. Now, the point that I was making in the presentation was that general education is designed to try and offer youngsters the entirety of a curriculum experience right through to the end of S3. So I think the question you're going to ask okay. is, why is that physics department offering youngsters uh, is, is an, irreversible, an irreversible choice of subject in advance of uh, National Score in 5 coming in? So 
I think that there's probably much more lies behind this. I'm not doubting the fact that this may be happening, but I think to suggest that somehow or other the conference is directly responsible for it is... No, and, and what, my point is that unintended consequences of things like the narrowing of choices, we're talking about only five, some, school, some schools only offering five choices as early as ST. I, I, I don't know the Grace Mount situation in particular, but I rather suspect that they're offering more than five subjects to no, study. Some, some schools, Bell for example. Yeah, I can't respond to those specifics, but I would have thought. Well, I would have thought that if you think the about the models on the education stopping website. Well, I think if you think about it, then why why is the school taking that particular decision? Is it because they want the youngster to depart <coughs> secondary education with five A hires in that subject, as opposed to a lesser clutch of qualifications that they might have uh, achieved? Had they taken eight subjects right through to the end of S4 and then spent two years trying to get hires to allow them to get qualifications into the university? I mean, one of the points about critical threats is it is about horses for courses when it comes to critical structure. And schools have to take the responsibility of deciding for themselves what is the most appropriate critical structure that they offer. It may very well be that Bill Baxter has taken that decision uh, to restrict the number of hires for very good reason. So there's much more lies behind all of that than, 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 than simply suggesting that you know, cost physics has dropped in a particular school for, for excellence as, as a whole. Well, the consequence of the narrowing curriculum, some schools are offering maths and physics. Well, the point, the point I made though is that it's not about narrowing a curriculum. Broad general education is designed to maintain a breadth of yeah, curriculum. Yeah, test two, I've talked to you about four, five and six. Well, as I say, I, I think if, if a school decides to restrict the number of hires <coughs> or restrict the number of subjects that a youngster undertakes in the senior phase, then from an inspection point of view, I would want to be clear as to what the rationale for doing that is. But it might very well be a very sound rationale in that these youngsters, in taking a much more restricted <coughs> number of subjects, have a much better opportunity of achieving entry into higher education, for example, than otherwise have been the case. Can, can I just add to this? That I, I, I think there has been some fear in universities about curriculum for excellence and a change in the standards of education, almost. I think this is just a fear, this may, I doubt that this is reality, around STEM subjects in particular. But I, I think the problem is actually much deeper than that because there's a sense in which your point is, is um, predicated on a change to this away from something that was previously actually working very well. And for STEM education in secondary schools, I have to say I don't think it has been working that well. I don't think there have been enough students coming in through schools doing basic sciences, chemistry, biology, physics, and of course mathematics. And if one looks at a lot of university campuses, at science buildings that were put up in the 1960s, you'll find in them huge lecture theatres that were designed to deliver biology, chemistry, physics. And those lecture theatres are now typically used to deliver arts, humanities, social sciences, because there aren't that number of science students coming in. This, is, I think, is a very deep and long-term problem that we need to address. And my feeling is, is that, in actual fact, curriculum for excellence and its changed philosophy of education might benefit science but potentially a great deal because it may move the emphasis away from what has, I think, been a very dry curriculum where students are required to know stuff and to repeat stuff in examinations towards something that actually gets the creativity and excitement of STEM subjects put <coughs> out there up front and gets students engaged with the subjects in a way that's much more exciting for them. It allows them freedom. Um, I have to say, I have been and you're right on both fronts, Phil. I mean, this has been a long-term decline. This isn't something that suddenly happened over a period of the last year or so. Uh, this has been something that's been happening for decades yeah. in Scotland. Uh, and the second point, you're absolutely right. 
surely if we can generate uh, youngsters who are well motivated to learn across a range of subjects and okay. who are getting a high quality, exciting experience yeah. in the STEM subjects, they are then therefore much more likely to, to choose those subjects and study them beyond uh, their school education. But there's a lot to be done in convincing teachers in some cases, and in some cases science teachers it has to be said, that they, they, they need that cultural shift yeah. in their thinking about what they offer. But all, all too many times I, I go in and inspect secondary school departments and they're still delivering the same stuff they've been delivering for in exactly the same way for many years. I was in a secondary school just the other week there where a teacher who taught in that school for 17 years proudly brought out uh, an acetate roll <laughs> with a complete set of lessons in maths <laughs> that he had devised in his first year of teaching. And he was still going round the screen <laughs> teaching aspects of math. Now I don't know, I'm not a mathematician, maybe math doesn't change that much. But if you're, absolute, if you're right in what you're saying, then that's the kind of teacher that needs to look at the, the approach that they're yeah. taking to these learners. And the question I would ask would be very simply, have they moved with the times? And have they, have they addressed the changes of the changing learners that are coming into schools? Good. Let's move on to the next question. Could you introduce I just, yourself? Alison Tobin, University of St Andrews. Um, I think the examples we've just heard tell us how pressing it is for universities to make it very clear what their admissions policies are. And it's quite disturbing to think that schools are making decisions now about subject choices that pre preempt our decisions on, on subjects that we will we'll be looking for in a couple of years' time. And one of the aspects of the University of Scotland report was that universities will be flexible in the way that they interpret these pathways, but there's still going to be a limit. And it disturbs me to think that some kids might have to do hires over several years to get sufficient qualifications for university places that are going to be very competitive. So I just hope they haven't burnt their bridges by the end of S3. Yeah, I, I would agree. I share your concern, also. I, mean, I think had, had some of the communication on the expectations of curriculum flex has been better, we'd have left less schools in that situation just now. <coughs> interested in the, the especially the theory of languages and uh, staff development and there's been a lot in the press and in the education journals about uh, the student the, the staff the teachers are concerned that they don't have the skills and the necessary staff development to deliver the curriculum for excellence to the standard that that is perhaps required and and I'm just interested are this are the skills in Scotland because if for things like if, if you're going to be teaching French to three-year-old upwards, for example, because of the decline in the uptake of language of languages, there's less language graduates. That sort of thing. I'm just I'm not I'm not criticising the curriculum for excellence at all. I'm just interested in do we at the moment do we have do our workforce have the skills and abilities that are required for the curriculum for excellence? It's a very good question, Fiona, and I mean I think we've been spectacularly unsuccessful in that area of modern languages for a number of years across Scotland. If you think about uh, NLPS, the Modern Languages and Primary School Initiative, I mean, what happened was there was huge resource invested in NLPS and primary schools to try and encourage teachers to become trained in primary schools. And all that happened was that they became a very, uh, a very valuable commodity for promotion purposes. And that you invested all of this resource in an individual P6 or P7 teacher who then became the uh, uh, who, who was then promoted a year or so later into another school because they wanted somebody who was that skilled in, in French uh, or German. It's particularly it's less of an issue in secondary. It's particularly an issue in primary. And the recent announcement by Scottish government about extending the range of languages that uh, youngsters should at least be exposed to in primary is undoubtedly a huge challenge on the CPD front. I mean, I talk to primary teachers regularly. I think there's a, a genuine willingness to try and to try and uh, uh, offer youngsters an opportunity to, to study different languages. I think the issue is one of the depth of study 
of that language. And my sense is that that many are prepared to to go into uh, some depth in one language, but the, the, it becomes much more challenging if you're going into a second or a third language. Uh, and you're you're right. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we, we we can turn that around quickly. But as part of the the Modern Languages report that came out recently, it made it very clear that CPD was going to be a key factor in the success or otherwise of this. Uh, and it's not just the science, and we go back to STEM, you know, difficulties that primary teachers have with the sciences, for example, and it's perhaps one of the reasons why there has been that decline uh, in, in science subjects uh, over recent years, because they're not being adequately encouraged or trained in the primary to give that kind of coherence of the learning uh, that's then picked up by subject specialists in secondary. Uh, so I can do nothing but agree with you, but I do think that there is a willingness within the primary sector to try and upskill to ensure that youngsters get the, the best deal in the modern languages Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Duncan Chappell from Glasgow School of Art. Um, I was interested in some of the examples you were giving of university courses being delivered within the school sector, a kind of distributed academy kind, kind of model. To what extent have you observed those courses being delivered through a true community of practice? And by that I mean university tutors working in intense collaboration with, with school teachers in order to kind of reimagine and re-engineer those courses. To, de to deliver them to a different um, set of students. My, my fear is that we'll end up with a situation where we have university courses simply being taken verbatim and presented in schools, which may not be appropriate. So I'm interested in how you've observed whether the communities of practice have actually developed between school tutors and, and university tutors. I, 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 mean, I, I have not observed it, so I have, must put my hands up. I have had secondary evidence and, and, and information on it, but certainly, from a University of Scotland perspective, I, I'm from a university, an individual university principal perspective. That's what exactly what you're saying is what we want to see, mm. and that's why we're quite, you know, in this university, quite excited by the prospect of of the school, absolutely, especially an upper secondary school, co-locating, mm. and it's not just it, it will create that, that that interchange, which is not just about this is what we do, you take it, mm. or or we'll come in and do it for you. It will be much more of a process where we'll have interaction. Uh, and and to have, for us to have two possibilities of that as a university moving forward is quite exciting. But, but I, I, haven't, I, I haven't been privy to, to, to University principals don't get seen very much in detail, to be perfectly <laughs> frank. Uh, but, but, but certainly the reports I've heard have been positive about, about the interactions. I mean, I've challenged the learning processes they've gone through, the assessment methodology, the fact it's very different from what they're facing here. And we are going to have you know, we, we, we put on support programmes and compensate for that as best we can. But we, you know, there's a real challenge in the university sector to look at as, as this transition process takes place. How do we best how do we best design curriculum and learning and teaching methodology that will cope with all of these things? Uh, and, and, you know, and it would be simple. And it would be simple. It would take a while for that all to feed through to that big bulk of our, our student population, which is Scottish based. But, but yeah, absolutely, it's a challenge. Any further questions? I'll just make a final comment. Um, I thought that was a brilliant question, Bill. Um, um, and I thought that because I asked it myself earlier on in the day. Um, <laughs> but I asked it in the context of what we're going to do in the enhancement theme over the coming year. Um, and we were looking today to identify some specific topics that we can take forward. And Curriculum for Excellence is undoubtedly one of them that we wish to pursue. Um, and I hope that we'll be able to maintain conversations with both of you as we do that. Um, because it's clearly of fundamental importance to the future of higher education. I, I have a very strong feeling here um, that there is really very good alignment so the work that we've done on enhancement themes through graduate attributes, the slide that you showed us, Seamus, identifies the sorts of things, the sorts of attributes we want our students to have. And it seems to me that those attributes are wholly coherent with what um, you're trying to produce in secondary education. The key challenge for us, in many ways, uh, other than managing the, the other 60%, which, as you say, is always with us, the key challenge is managing the transition. 
Um, and I think that's one of the things that we will have to pay significant attention to over, over the coming year um, as we get ready to receive our first um, CFE entrance in, what, 2015? Yes. And I think that's a very sensible thing to be looking at. Absolutely. Good. I, I would like to conclude by offering my um, warmest thanks to the University of West of Scotland and Des Neville for um, organising this and hosting this event. To Ken Muir and Seamus McJay for giving us excellent presentations and stimulating what I think has been a very good discussion. And thank you all very much for attending. <coughs>